This is my actual real copy of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I figure there's no better source for how to improve Total War than one of the most classic pieces of military literature. Just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. Every Total War title is significantly different from each other. They all have such significant gameplay changes that comparing them directly can be challenging, and this makes for a really fascinating series from an analysis perspective, though less from an actually playing a good video game perspective. Every game throws out old ideas and adds new ones, but CA's creative designers have gotten so overzealous with innovating that they've made their newer titles much less compelling experiences as a result. Whether to concentrate or divide your troops must be decided by circumstance. A general in Rome was just a very good unit. They could be moved around wherever you wished, they could be leading a massive legion, humbly managing a town, exploring on their own, or sitting in a city that has an academy with other generals who too are becoming scholars to better themselves. They worked identically to other units and were themselves simply a tool to be wielded on the battlefield, only unique in that they couldn't be recruited from cities. On the other hand, a general in modern Total War games are what everything revolves around. Cities no longer recruit units, they recruit generals who recruit the units. All units must be attached to a general's army at all times, and if there is ever a time where an army goes without a general, such as if they die in combat, these games will shit themselves and force you to dump your treasury to get a new one, even if it is a horrible strategic decision. The act of choosing to get a new general is one of great importance because, especially in Warhammer, a new army will have such an immense demand on your upkeep. Not in like an understandable way either, like you simply need to pay more people, but having an additional army suddenly skyrockets your entire empire's upkeep costs like you just conscripted all of the tax collectors. In modern Total War games after this change, you are no longer managing an army. You are managing armies. A handful of people with very large banners under their control. This may seem like a semantic difference, but it makes these games play so palpably differently. Before, you controlled a cohesive force with garrisons all across the world, and scouting parties getting into skirmishes. Now, all of your elements are entirely divorced from each other, bar the extremely occasional reinforcement battle, which are really only seen on certain races because of cheese tactics. I hate to say this, but this is dumbing the game down a lot. At the risk of sounding like hyperbole, I would say that this fundamental change to the structure of armies is at the cost of nearly all of the strategic layer's depth. No ruler should put troops into the field merely to gratify his own spleen. You can't manage garrisons anymore, so all of your troops have to be in a giant stack, and this leads to a very, very big problem. The garrisons that you do have are going to be auto-generated when a settlement is attacked, and they are inevitably either too weak or too strong. There is no perfect balance that can be achieved, and Warhammer proves this by having both extremes in it already, depending on which race you're fighting. The vast, vast majority of battles in a Total War campaign are offensive siege battles, and they are easily the most miserable type of battles to play. Cities have a garrison of units which are free and walk out to defend the city whenever it's attacked. If these free default garrisons are too weak, it makes conquering their land absolutely piss easy. There will only really be one real battle where you fight their full stack, and the rest will be auto-resolving sieges. If the garrisons are too strong, however, the exact opposite problem happens, and you're forced to play every single siege battle, cheese the hell out of the AI, play extremely safe, and then pass out from exhaustion. The worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. This exposes a flaw in Total War, which I believe is terminal, as it affects all of their games. Siege battles are the worst part of the game by far, and given the unsuccessful amount of attempts that CA have had at making them work, I think it's safe to say that they're probably unsalvageable. This is of course at its worst in Warhammer, where the sieges are unbelievably grueling and boring, but it's also just as bad in pretty much every other title in my opinion. Pathfinding problems galore, slogfest battles that take forever with little to no tactical depth, and they're so common. Sieges in real life are not quick affairs. Nor are they usually one battle as they are often depicted to be in Total War. Real life sieges are hard to properly represent because a city is enormous and even Total War can't do that kind of scale. Sieges are more accurately done in Crusader Kings where they just sort of stand around for a while until the fort surrenders. But 
That's boring. This can be done in Total War, and it's not implemented very well. If you siege a settlement for a set number of turns, a sally battle, where the defenders leave their fort to assault their besiegers, is forced, and the defenders have to fight you, or they explode. <laughs> This is extremely gamey and makes very little sense, as siege attrition doesn't exist in most Total War games. What I mean by that is that when sieging a settlement, the enemy doesn't lose troops over time. Logically, they should get progressively more paranoid over time, losing morale and other stats with every turn that they're sieged, as well as slowly bleeding troops as they get picked off by the besiegers day and night. As it is, though, it's implied that they're entirely, completely fine until they run out of their two and a half year long stockpile of food, where the entire garrison will simultaneously detonate. Ideally, I'd like to be able to pick different siege tactics to use against different castles. Sun Tzu has quite a lot to say about sieges, and so I'd like to look at four passages for insights on what should be included. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. This would be the most straightforward option. Your men conducting evening raids, killing those who poke their heads out of the castle's crenellations, and hunting any who dare patrol outside the walls would gradually lead to the garrison of the fort losing not only men over time, but also general stats, namely morale. I imagine there could also be text to further this as well, as you discover and imagine new ways to horrify and sabotage your enemy. A wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. In warfare, you are inevitably going to find yourself in a place of overextension and in need of supplies. With an increase to the province's devastation or public order, your troops gain replenishment while sieging the town as they sack nearby villages and force nearby civilians and captured soldiers into service. All warfare is based on deception. Deception in covert warfare is not something that Total War really touches at all, even though it's pretty crucial to war itself. There are so many things that this could be, like hiding the size of your force, but for this to be actually used and have a practical application against AI enemies, I would recommend for this to be a wooden army. When you deploy for the siege, or when the enemy sallies out against you, you could deploy a fake force of units which aren't actually real as a diversionary force to distract. Even if the enemy wouldn't have to get that close to identify that they're fake, it would still be incredibly useful. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. One of the options could be a percent chance to request a surrender and or bribe the garrison to let you in, which would only really work on settlements with little to no garrison. Every unit you actually put in the garrison yourself would dramatically reduce the success rate of this, if this is contextualized as a bribe of the garrison, I don't think it should actually cost anything though. Though you might remember that the quote to start this section was, The worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. My actual suggestion is none of the above. It's to remove sieges. Entirely. I'm aware that probably sounds insane with Total War's established gameplay loop being a siege merry-go-round, but I think this can quite reasonably be done with an adjustment of scale and context. Even the largest battles in Total War don't come near average significant historical battles when it comes to the amount of men deployed on the battlefield, and it isn't the only scaling inconsistency. This castle is barely a kilometer across. These are obviously done for gameplay reasons, but I still think they can be addressed in context and sieges can be given a proper replacement. I propose defensive infrastructure inside cities like walls, recruitment buildings, and new patrol buildings give significant defensive buffs to any allied armies either within the province or within a radius around the city. Fights against these armies would still be field battles, but depending on the city's infrastructure, they could get access to defensive emplacements like stakes, maybe a watchtower or seven, stat buffs, and or a stream of reinforcements. I think this is the best possible solution. You get to play more field battles, and defensive infrastructure still gives sizable buffs which come into play way more often than they would if only applied during sieges. So what about the actual cities themselves? If you can build walls, what's the point? There are a couple solutions, and my favorite is to recontextualize cities to provinces. Even as it stands, the city situation barely makes sense in any of the Total War games. Getting rid of them entirely and assigning everything that they do to the province they reside in, kind of like how Shogun 2 does with its farms and other local resources, would be a huge improvement in my opinion. Taking over these would consist of raiding these locations, and then they're yours. You conquer piece by piece and be forced to consider splitting up your forces to maximize efficiency, which forces you to consider, it is the rule in war, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one, to surround him, if five to one, to attack him, if twice as numerous, to divide our army in two. 
If they do keep cities, while I would remove siege battles, I wouldn't remove sieging. Making waiting for the siege mandatory would be an okay choice in my opinion, but it'd have to be accompanied by massive other gameplay changes. None of the existing Total War games would really function if this is how it worked. I think, anyway? Maybe it would actually be fine. Considering most of the game-changing events in Medieval 2 show up at around turn 2 trillion, maybe this is actually just how the game is intended to be played. I'd much prefer the other option of bringing the province and city systems into harmony though, as conquering a province infrastructure by infrastructure is a lot more logical than how the games currently function. If you think removing siege battles entirely is silly, let me share with you the full passage that follows the quote that this section began with. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, with the result that one third of his men are slain, while the town still remains undertaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. In short, siege battles are a bad idea. They should be removed wholesale. In order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there must be an advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. An enormous flaw with Total War is the lack of interesting victory conditions. I already talked about this in depth in quite a good video that no one watched, and so I will not repeat those points again. Go watch it here, please. The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat. Since Warhammer, Total War has had this rather unhealthy obsession with one entity units, and it has even infected historical titles with three kingdoms. Total War in general doesn't seem to quite understand that unit size has enormous balance ramifications and is not a graphics option. Static defenses such as towers are always the same regardless of unit size, and so they just get irrelevant at higher unit scales while they are unbelievably crushing at low scales. Units that are incredibly bursty like Fall of the Samurai's Revolver Cav become fucking ridiculous at high unit scales as they absolutely delete entire units at once. With one entity units now in play and enforced in every fight with lords becoming mandatory in Warhammer, even if they did get their stats reduced based on unit scale, it means that on low, a hero or lord can effectively stunlock an entire unit until death. This is further muddied by the highest unit scale debatably not even being the best way to play. Total War Pathfinding is about as advanced as a bunch of blind ants in a jar, and the units with a gigantic amount of entities are just playing with fire, especially in sieges where, for some godforsaken reason, in basically all of the Total War games made over seven decades, cities have exceptionally narrow city streets for no reason, just to make the pathfinding even worse. The second largest unit scale tends to be the best in my experience to minimize pathfinding issues, but it does feel bad to lose out on the grandiose size of max unit scale. Though the one entity issue starts with Warhammer, I think the obsession probably started in Shogun 2. Kind of. Its amazing CG intro shows what I mean perfectly with a duel between a Takada Samurai and an Iko Iki warrior monk. Actual Sengoku Jidai history has a lot of these stories too, and this very dude right here, Takada Shingen, daimyo of his clan, is documented to have fought another daimyo, Usuki Kenshin, half a dozen times man to man. That is fucking insane. Imagine if Charlemagne fought opposing kings man on man and ran into the same one seven times on the battlefield over the course of years. That kind of thing simply did not happen in feudal Europe. I think that was the vibe Creative Assembly were attempting to manifest with single entity units, and instead they made superheroes. Total Warhammer is a case study in how you can dump all of your development time into a presentation with a wealth of content and still have a completely shit game underneath. It looks incredible. Seeing all of these units depicted to this level of quality is like something out of a tabletop fan's dream, but as an actual video game, I would rather play games in the same series which are 20 years its senior. I'm adding this disclaimer way later in production, I just realized I should acknowledge that I know Sun Tzu wasn't Japanese and so wouldn't look like this. I just asked Jenna to draw him like a samurai because this was originally centered around Shogun 2, and because I thought it was funny. I accidentally started a new section last time, which is a comment highlight. I think it makes sense as its own thing, and for two reasons. It promotes positivity and is wholesome to point out comments that make me feel nice, and it's also a psyop to get you to comment on my videos more so that they get pushed to more people. Last time, I talked about The Last Samurai a bit, and someone left this comment about the movie. I messaged the person that I watched the film with because I thought it was funny, and it was his comment. Whoops. 
There were too many of these to individually highlight, but it made me very happy to see all of the people theory crafting potential fictional firearms that are either depicted in media or just sound cool. Thank you for these. I did have a lot of people point out the differences between the different types of black powder firearms that I was talking about, and I didn't mention this in the video because, frankly, no one needs to know this shit. <laughs> Realistically, no one at the D&D table needs to know the difference between a flintlock, a matchlock, and a caplock, and so I didn't bother wasting your time explaining it. Lastly, and this might get a full video at some point, why is tabletop combat bad? Well, it varies heavily on system, obviously, but my main two issues are consistently how much of a time sync positioning is when it ultimately has very little importance, and how horrifically poorly balanced most systems are, where it feels like I have to remake them myself, and in Lancer's case, I literally broke and did. Some more specific problems to D&D adjacent systems are shitty cover mechanics, overcomplicated nature of spell slots, seriously, just use a mana system, and the existence of guaranteed damage at all, not to mention how common it is. Like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill. Thanks to my patrons, and me especially, and have a good night.